team. Hi. Welcome back to my garage. Um, we've got episode six just getting ready to drop. It's gonna, we're halfway into it. Second half is gonna happen here shortly. But as I'm doing episode six, I'm realizing that I'm using a couple tools. Well, using some tools today and then uh, used some tools uh, a couple days ago that need a little bit more fill-in detail than I'm gonna be able to provide in a straight episode. So, um, we're going to drop out a first here, uh, episode 5.5, what we're going to call a tool interlude. Uh, the two tools I want to talk about real quick are um, screw extractors and files. Uh, I used some screw extractors the other day to take a stuck screw out of the back of a cabinet door. We're redoing our kitchen cabinets here at the crib, and one of the one of the screws in the hinges that we were taking off in order to sand and paint the doors uh, was stripped, right? And it took a Phillips head screwdriver. It was really stuck tightly, and the Phillips head screwdriver slipped a couple times and stripped it out so you couldn't grab it, right? Um, and so I needed to get that screw out. So I used what's called a screw extractor set, which I'm going to show you right here. Um, this comes in lots of different sizes, um, lots of different shapes for lots of different fasteners, but a basic one to take out a... Um, a screw with a Phillips head screw or even a pretty significantly large bolt um, in a car or anything you know, you know or anything like that if it's threaded uh, this is what you need to take those things out when they're broken and here's how it works you start by drilling a hole into the top of the stuck fastener right so you're drilling through the head and you're effectively drilling down into the into the shank or the shaft of the of the fastener um, once you do that, you pull the screw out, you pull your drill bit back out, and you grab the corresponding extractor right here. Uh, you can tell these are conical, right? The heads are the, the heads are tapered and threaded. The threads on these, on this set, they're left-handed, right? Most of the normal fasteners that we use in day-to-day -day life are what you call a right-hand thread, or uh, you think righty-tighty, that's a right-hand thread. Uh, these extractors are left-hand threaded, so they... As they, um, you'll, you'll thread these in by screwing them to the left. Uh, when you, when you, when you screw these into, into the, the hole that you just drilled, right, because these are conical, the more it screws in, the tighter it gets up against the walls of the, of that hole that you just drilled, right? And so as it gets tighter and tighter, it starts to grab the fastener that's stuck. It starts to grab it, and since you're turning it counterclockwise, it starts to remove that stuck fastener. It's pretty sweet, really. Um, the best way to do this part, I mean, you're going to drill this part out with your hand drill, right? Uh, and after you pull that out, then you're going to put your extractor into a, what's called a tap wrench. A tap wrench looks something like this. This is what comes with your tap and die set. If you haven't, if you haven't taken a shop class with me, uh, or even if you have taken it with me, either way, uh, a, tap and, a tap set is used, to, um, is used to add threads. So here's a tap, right? The tap is what you use to cut threads on the inside of a hole. It's really basic stuff for a lot of you, but for some of you not. Uh, it uses to cut threads on the inside of a hole, right? So if you want to, if you want to thread something into a hole that you've drilled, a bolt, screw, whatever, you figure out what thread it is, you find the matching tap size for that thread, and then you thread it down into the hole, and it leaves threads on the inside of the hole. This is, I mean, it's a whole thing in itself, but um, during that process, you use this tap wrench. So you, you tighten it onto the square end of the tap, and then very slowly you tap the threads in the hole, right? By by turning this like this. It's nice because it has a handle on either side, so you can apply it. You can apply the torque uh, on either side uh, of the center pivot, right? So it's nice and even. It cuts in there nice and evenly. And you, you want to do the same thing with your extractor, right? You want your extractor to go in nice and straight up and down. And uniform and, and so that it grabs the size of the hole um, uniformly. If you don't, if you allow it to get off axis as you twist it, it's going to twist out, twist loose, and it's going to end up strip, sort of stripping out the inside of the hole that you just drilled and making the inside of that hole conical, and it'll make it harder for this thing to grab. So it's good to put this in by hand instead of putting this in your drill. Uh, instead of putting these extractors in your drill chuck and trying to put your drill on reverse and drill it out, it's too fast. And instead of grabbing cleanly, it's just going to kind of grab a tiny bit and strip it away and, uh, and end up just boring out your hole. So do this by hand. Uh, got a quick video of me running this thing on the cabinet door. We'll cut to that and you can see some live action footage.
just like that. So this is your tap wrench, so you usually one handle loosens and tightens this jaw. You pull that out. This lets you apply your force like symmetrically so you're not torquing it too much on one side. This goes back into your screw extractor set. So again, these have a left hand thread, so you're putting it in, um, you're, you're driving it down in there counterclockwise, so when it finally bites, when this conical section bites in the hole, it removes the screw counterclockwise. A lot of times the drill bits are also counterclockwise, so make sure you check the twist of your drill bit in your set. And if this has a left hand twist, also make sure you have your drill on reverse when you drill out the pilot hole in the, uh, in the old stuck screw. One last thing about a screw extractor set, the trade name for it is uh, an easy out. So um, kind of like vice grips is the trade name for locking pliers, or channel locks is the uh, trade name for adjustable pliers, groove joint pliers. Um, trade name for a screw extractor is an easy out. You might hear that somewhere along the way. Okay, uh, moving on to file. Um, I'm sure you all have seen a file. You certainly have if you've been in my shop. Um, you use a file to um, sharpen or to sharpen things, right? To put an edge on something. Basically, you use it to remove material um, slowly, whether it be from the edge of a lawnmower blade, like we're going to do here in a bit. Um, if you have a rough edge on, you know, if you had a rough edge on one of the things you worked on in the metal shop and you wanted to try and smooth that off, uh, if you have a rough edge on your fingernail, you can uh, remove that with a file. Um, but you're removing material sort of gradually, right? Um, it turns out, and this is so amazing, it turns out, I guess it shouldn't be a surprise, but the, the sort of history and the um, historical significance and use of files is incredibly interesting, uh, as well as the sort of nomenclature of different file types and shapes. Um, I mean, I had like the loose idea about how files were classified, but I dug into it a little bit this morning, and it's straight fascinating, fascinating so I'm going to share it with you now. Um, uh, first, the history part. For today's hashtag cross curricular, you need to ring a bell in here or something every time I go hashtag cross curricular on you. We'll do that next time too. Um, so back in the day, right, when you would make metal parts for something, um, uh, you would make metal parts for a car or for a cotton gin or for a whatever you're making out of metal. Um, that metal part, to get it close to the perfect shape, you would either forge it or cast it, basically, right? I mean, you all know what it means to forge, right? To, to get metal hot and then to shape it by impact with a hammer, or some kind of hammer, some kind of striking. Uh, so you could forge parts, or you could cast parts, right? You could get molten metal, make a mold for the part in the size that you wanted it to be, pour that molten metal into the, into the, into the casting, and then, well, and then it became a casting, right? You would cast that metal. Um, but even then, once you forged it, or once you cast it out of molten alloy, um, those parts weren't right on the money. So to get them close, to get them to work smoothly together and to fit properly in the mechanical assembly, you need to use files. And that was a whole thing. I mean, back before the day of mass production and what we think of as modern machining, there were, that, that's what lots and lots and lots of people did. There were file parts to make mechanical things. Um, um, and when they did that, you know, they would make the first part in the assembly, and then they would get the second part in the assembly and get it close and fit them together. And when they were they rubbed or where they didn't fit correctly, they would file that part off, right? Um, so by the time they got to the end of this thing, the end of this whole assembly, whatever it was, in a car, those things all fit perfectly together because a person had gone by hand and had fit each one together with a file by removing material in the right places. Um, but if you built two cars that were pretty much the same and you tried to interchange parts between those two vehicles or any two mechanical assemblies, it, it was not guaranteed to fit. They were not exactly the same, even to a rough tolerance. Um, so in other words, those parts were non-interchangeable. Can you imagine what it would be like if things were like that now? Like if, um, like if you know, recently we replaced the, uh, we replaced the half shaft in my minivan in auto shop, right? Can you imagine if we would have to make a new one by hand, right? cast it, and then machine it to fit machine it with a file by hand to fit with the other one. It's crazy town. Uh, instead, I just got on Rock Auto and ordered one. It came to my door and we stuck it in because we knew it was interchangeable, right? That's the kind of uh, magical machine tolerance manufacturing that we have today. 
But back in the day, they did not, right? They were just they were just filing things down. Um, uh, and it went on like that until the late 1700s, um, until you know who it is. Say it in your head. Who uh, invented interchangeable parts? Well, pretty much invented Eli Whitney, right? The cotton gin guy. Uh, he actually uh, made the cotton gin first, and then he um, he made a contract with the government to build a whole bunch of guns because they were afraid in the late 1700s, early 1800s, that we were going to be in a war with France. Uh, and Eli Whitney. Um, uh, got a contract to make a lot of guns, and in part he got this contract by showing that he could make parts. He just have a bunch of parts in bins, and he could just pick any random part out of that bin and stick it together and make the gun, which was pretty amazing at the time. Um, anyway, so that's your history uh, for the day, your history lesson. We'll put the Wikipedia link for that up there. Um, so back to files. Um, I'm sure that you picked up files in my shop. Um, you probably also picked up files in the wood shop that are generally um, have that are more coarse, right? And have bigger teeth. So that's the first thing to note about a file is what's called the cut, and that refers to how fine the teeth are. So kind of like sandpaper has a grit, files have what's called a cut. Um, I'm just going to look at my notes here. So if you go from rough to smooth, right? The roughest cut you can have on a file is called a rough cut. So moving from rough to smooth, rough cut, middle, bastard, second cut smooth and dead smooth. Those are your steps. Those are your gradations in file tooth roughness. Okay? So a rough cut is going to remove significantly more material on one pass than is a second cut file. Um, the, uh, a good middle of the road cut for metal work is a bastard cut. Um, that's what we're going to use later today to sharpen this lawnmower blade. Um, uh, it takes off a good amount of material. It's not super fine, like you're not going to use to polish anything. But it's um, it's good for sort of rough rough work, but not super rough, right? Um, the second thing about a file, I guess the second important thing to talk about is the cut, not the cut. I'm sorry, the uh, the shape, right? So this one I'm holding up is called a mill file. A mill file mill file has a rectangular cross sectional area, uh, so it flat surfaces, right? So if you want to end up with a flat surface, a mill file is a good one to use. Um, Next thing we have is a square cut. So it's got a square cross section. This is just stuff I had sitting around in my garage that I've got from an auction maybe 20 years ago in a five gallon bucket. So I don't have every available one here. I'll throw the Wikipedia link up for this too. Um, the square cut files, um, well, it's good for making squares, right? Especially if it's tapered. So this has a little bit of taper. Um, it's good for not necessarily good for making square holes, but it's good for enlarging and squaring up square holes if you have the right size. We have a triangular, uh, three square or a triangular file. So this has a triangular cross section, right? Uh, then you get to things that have circular cross sections. You can either have a, you can either have a round file, which is just straight round like a cylinder, right? The entire file is cylindrical. Uh, you can also have what's called a rat tail file. So a rat tail file has a circular cross section, but it's tapered, right? So as I move from here to here, the cross sectional area decreases. Taper's pretty nice for enlarging holes. Um, I'd say it's probably the more common circular cross section file to find in hardware stores and in shops. Uh, it's called a rat tail file because it kind of looks like a rat's tail, right? It tapers to the end. Um, and then the last one that I have here is called a half round file. So it's it's flat on one side and um, convex on the other side, right? So it's some section of a circle here on the other side. Um, this is good if you're, obviously it's good if you're working on a rounded, if you have a really big hole and you want to try and round it as you go around, but you don't want to hit it. You know, if you try and hit, if you try and file out the inside of a circle with a flat file, the only thing it's going to hit are your edges, right? So if you're trying to, to file out the inside of something round and big, use one of these, uh, half round files. Okay, that's it. Episode 5.5. Tool interludes. Uh, following very soon. Episode 6. Tune up on the lawnmower. Hope you all are doing well today. Cool and sunny. Pretty nice outside. Good day to work outside. Don't get too hot. I transplanted a couple hosses this morning. And oh, what else did I do? i tell you what else I did. We have a... Um, 
goofy like lawn ornament thing. It's not goofy, it's pretty sweet actually. And it's got a dragonfly on it. And each wing of the dragonfly is hinged and then attached to a weight. So if it blows around in the wind, the weights kind of swing and it makes the dragonfly's wings go like this. The hinges were all rusty, right? So I cleaned them out first with some WD-40. The WD-40 is not going to last too long outside. This doesn't have much sticking power. It's not a very heavy oil, right? So I sprayed it with some uh, white lithium grease, which I think will make it last for a long time. The dragonfly wings flapping. Okay, enough silliness for now. That's it for episode 5.5. .5. We'll catch you real soon, right back here in the garage for episode 6.